to First Presbyterian Church in Joliet. I am Bo Mircha, associate pastor here, and it's my great joy to welcome you in this hour of worship. I keep thinking about how important worship is in our life and how this one hour that we spend together can change our lives. Part of it is because God wants to fellowship with us again and again. From the time of creation, God wanted to spend time with his people. And when you think about the law and the Sabbath, about having a day that is dedicated unto God, those are things that are not to be taken easy because there is so much power and richness in, in, in it. So this is a time for us to come and to receive the blessing of God. So I invite you to open your hearts, open your minds, open your soul to what God is going to do. It's time for us to worship. Let's worship. God is with you. God invites us into a relationship with him and calls us to worship. We read in the scripture, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon his name while he is near. The Lord God who loves us deeply is calling us into a time of worship with him together with his people. God through Jesus Christ is reaching out to us in love. Please pray with me. God, we thank you that you love us deeply and you reach out to us again and again through Christ Jesus, through your Holy Spirit. So nurture and shape and guide us as we worship you together this day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
And can I have the kids uh, come a little closer? I want you to think about your best friend right now. Can you see them in your mind? Can you do me a favor and shout their name out? Did you do it? Cool. So I want to share with you about one of Jesus' friends today. You see, we've been talking about the 12 disciples. And not only the disciples, but Jesus' friends, people, people that loved Jesus and followed him and shared the good news that Jesus had with other people. Today, I want to talk to you about Andrew. Andrew was Simon Peter's brother. And Andrew was the first one to see Jesus. And he goes on and says, I have found the Messiah. I have found, you know, the salvation of God. Why don't you come and meet him? And as you follow the story of Jesus, you see that Andrew does the same thing again and again. You see, it's really important for us to, to, to know about Andrew that he believed in Jesus, that Jesus was so important to him that he wanted to share that with other people. Andrew had a lot of people for his friends and the people around. And for him, loving them was sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, that is very important to all of us because I believe that Jesus is my friend. And I know that you, you know that too, that Jesus is your friend. Now, what we do with that is very important. You see, we can be very selfish and keep it all to ourselves and not tell anybody about it. Or we can be like Andrew and share the good news of Jesus and invite other people to come to know him. Now, how we do that? Well, every, that depends, right? Sometimes you can have a conversation with somebody and that person can go through a hard time and you can say, I will pray for you. Other times, somebody is in need and you go and help them and you do that and say, because I love you and because I love God, I want to share this with you. And you help them out. Sometimes you just have to tell people, I believe in Jesus. And because I believe in Jesus, this is what I do and what I believe. So I want to encourage you to first know Jesus. Know more about Jesus every day. Read your Bible, listen to the stories, listen to other people's stories about Jesus, and get to know the goodness of Jesus. Second thing, I want you to be so excited about your friend Jesus that you are able to shout his name out just like you did for your best friend. You see, the Bible has a beautiful message of God's love. And that message needs to be spread around. And guess what? You are one of the people that can help that, may, uh, that happen. You can be an Andrew telling people about God's love. So I want to challenge you this week to do just that. Maybe write a letter, make a phone call, maybe talk to a friend and tell them about Jesus. I would love to hear your story later on. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you come into our lives and you let your love transform who we are. And we pray, Lord, that out of that love, we can serve the people around us and let them see who you are, your goodness. So Lord, be with us. Help us to be your disciples. In your name we pray, amen. You have an awesome week. Community updates. It's springtime, can you believe that? 
we're springing, uh, springing forth an hour and we're already thinking about Easter and the joy uh, that we have at Easter time. So very important things for us to, to put on our calendar. Number one, Mark Morrison is uh, starting on March 24th at 6.30, a hybrid Bible study uh, on the book uh, Love Does. Uh, and um, it's gonna be both in person here at church in room 210 and online on Zoom. So please watch uh, the newsletter for more information on that. But remember, there is uh, a new Bible study uh, class that uh, is going to start on the 24th and you are invited to be part of that. Contact the church office uh, and we'll get the information to you. And um, that brings, brings me up to Palm Sunday. You know, Easter is coming, right? And um, we have uh, thought about how much we're missing our traditional Easter egg hunt and uh, seeing people. So we thought, how about a Palm Sunday rally, you know? We remember that Jesus entered in Jerusalem, lots of people came out and rejoiced in, in seeing him and shouted, Hosanna. How cool it will be for us to have a little rally of our own where everybody is invited to come and you can be at church service just like on a regular Sunday from nine to 10 o'clock and after following the, the service, we're gonna have in the parking lot across the street, we're gonna have set up uh, a little welcome center for, uh, for that. We're, for the kids, we have special surprises. We have uh, crafts and uh, little goodies and things like that. And maybe even the Easter Bunny might show up. I'm not really sure, don't tell that to anyone yet. Uh, and, uh, uh, Parish Council is going to have a special treat for the adults. So it's our way of start thinking about how important is this season in our lives, right? Palm Sunday, Easter, it's always, always important. And that brings me to Easter Sunday. Now we are planning for two services on Easter Sunday, at 9 o'clock and at 10.30. And uh, we want you to, to make reservation ahead of time, like, uh, just like before. And um, I think with great enthusiasm and expectation towards that day, because it will, you know, it's always so good to be in God's house and celebrate uh, the resurrection. So I want to encourage you to, uh, to be excited about what's coming up. So remember, Bible study on the 24th starting. If you need information, email the, the office and we'll get you that information. Uh, Palm Sunday rally, everybody welcome. We're gonna have uh, things for kids, adults, for everybody. And then uh, Easter Sunday, two services, make reservation ahead of time. I hope that you're enjoying this beautiful day and have a great week. Take care.
ask you, we praise your name all day long, and we thank you for your love and goodness. We ask you to bless the reading of your words here, and we thank you for this guidance, this, this word, this map for our lives. And we give you all the praise and glory and love you forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of the psalm, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar at all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Hello and good morning. My name is Clarence Red. Our family have been members of First Presbyterian in Joliet for over 20 years. We were first introduced to First Presbyterian by our good friend Gene Venegas while our kids were attending Joliet Montessori together. We also were introduced uh, further to First Presbyterian Church while our kids were attending the Suzuki method of violin. During the time that our children were enjoying their lessons of uh, violin through the Suzuki method at the church, my wife and I were exposed to the numerous programs that were available at First Presbyterian. And during that particular time, our previous church, which was Christ Episcopal Church in Joliet, had closed and we were looking for a new church. Once we eventually joined the church, our children participated in many of the, the numerous programs, such as Logos, Youth Group, uh, Journey to Bethlehem, and uh, one of our favorites uh, for our family was uh, Trunk or Treat. My wife and I also became uh, involved in uh, the numerous things in the church as well, uh, numerous programs as well. Uh, my, one of my favorites was the mission trip, and my wife's favorite was the uh, women's choir that practiced during uh, the time that the kids had logos. And actually our daughter, about two years ago, was married at the church. Our family has found a church home in First Presbyterian. That is one of the big reasons why we give to the church. The church has given so much to us, we're happy to give back to that uh, wonderful church that is given to us. The donations and pledges uh, from members helps bring all of these wonderful programs uh, to our community and to our members. Please consider all the church has done for you and for our community um, when making your pledge. Thank you very much. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, so we might not perish but have eternal life, the life that is really and truly life. And so now in our time of worship, we have an opportunity to give back to God. Paul writes to us in Ephesians saying that we should be imitators of God in our life. God gives to us. We give to God. We give to others in love, just as we have been loved in Christ. There are a number of ways that we can give our tithes and offerings to the life, ministry, and mission of First Presbyterian Church to support Christ's work here and in the world. We can give my mail, mailing in our offerings. We can give uh, by our website, using the Give tab. We can give electronically, setting that up with our treasure, or now that we're back in live worship, we can give in live worship as well. However we give, we show our love and our joy in Christ Jesus when we give of our time, our talents, and our offerings to support Christ's work 
in the world. So let us give and be imitators of God in love. God is active in the world and active in our lives. So now let's take this time in worship to pray and express 
our thoughts and the meditations of our heart to our God. I'll start in silent prayer that you might say your own prayers and then I'll lead us in prayer. Please pray with me. Loving God, in the wilderness, you supplied water to your people. When throats have been dry or your people have felt parched, you have led them to streams of your kindness, bringing refreshment and new life. We thank you for the living water of Jesus, knowing that in him we need not ever thirst again. Cleansed of our sin and justified by Christ's faithfulness and sacrifice, we receive the promises of your grace. Given new hope of sharing your glory, we come before you with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts as the source of our having been washed and set apart as Christ's church. Hear our prayers for all those who feel pain and sorrow. May they persevere with greater patience and strength, and may you set them free from their pain. May our arms enfold them as we support them, whatever be their trials. May our presence be a comfort as we bear with those who know sickness and disease. Lord, touch them with your healing power. We read in the scriptures that endurance develops character. So we ask that may we, through our mutual forbearance, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, learn what it means to trust in your reconciling love. Having sent us your Son, who himself agonized with death, you have shown us to what extent you will go to relieve estrangement, sin, and distress. With our lives attuned to your purposes and your will, O Lord, may we be of hope to those needing your word. And may that word be one of reconciliation as others are enabled in Christ to find peace in your care and your presence. Give us faith, O God, like your faithful people in each and every time. And let us not be among those who would put you to the test, rather trusting in Jesus, who invites us to drink from the well of eternal life. May we draw from him. And may we offer our time, our talents, our resources, and service in love to our neighbors who are in need. We ask that you would work through all your people and your churches, the followers of Christ throughout our communities and throughout all the world. Work, O Lord, your love and goodness and grace through your people in every place and every nation so that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We make this prayer in his name. Amen and amen. And now let us continue our worship together.
Jesus. Who are you in the church? This is what we're thinking about during this Lenten season. Now, so far we've talked about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was known for his, his real talk. And there are people in the church that know how to speak the truth in love. We've talked about people with great potential, people like Peter. There are others in the church that also have potential like Peter did. We talked about shepherds, people who are able to offer compassion and care. And we've talked about providers, people that share their resources, people like Lydia and the poor widow. You know, one of the really great things about Team Jesus is there's not a limit on the number of people that can be on the team. It's truly a team that is without limit. Everybody is welcome. In fact, Jesus wants us to grow the team. He wants it to be as big as it possibly can. And there are some people in the church that are gifted with this. Some people that are good at, at invitationalism, at hospitality. And today we're thinking about two kinds of invitation. One, follow me, is an invitation that Jesus issues. The other, come and see, is an invitation that we issue to one another. I absolutely love what Bob Goff had to say about this in his book, Love Does. Listen to this. When you read the Bible, the people who love Jesus and follow him are the ones like me who don't get invited places. Jesus told his friends they were invited anyway. In fact, he told them that the religious people aren't the ones that decide who gets into heaven and who doesn't. He said the people who follow him should think of themselves more like ushers rather than bouncers, and it will be God who decides who gets in. We are the ones who simply show people their seats that someone else paid for. I mean, those words take a lot of pressure off, right? We don't have to make any, any eternal decisions. We just get to invite people to come and see. Now in the scripture that we're reading for today, Jesus has already started calling his disciples. He's already started inviting people to follow him. He's already called Andrew. And Andrew, as soon as he realized who Jesus was, he ran to his brother Simon Peter and he said, come and see, come and see. Because invitation is important, right? I mean, when's the last time that you showed up at a party or some, some event that seemed closed without an invitation? I mean, we generally wait to be invited first, right? It, it's polite and it's often, it's always less awkward to show up somewhere we've been invited. And it's even less awkward when we get to hang out with the person or the persons who invited us there. So Jesus invited Andrew, Andrew invited Peter. Ultimately, of course, it's Jesus who invited Peter to follow him, but it was Andrew who initiated, initiated the invitation. Now I'm starting today by telling you about Andrew because I feel as if I can relate to Andrew. I get the impression that Andrew was just a little bit of an introvert, and I'm also an introvert. But I want everybody to understand that issuing the invitation to come and see doesn't mean that you have to be able to, to go on a long theological tangent with somebody. It doesn't mean that you have to quote scripture verses one after another. It doesn't even take a long conversation to invite someone to a church worship service, whether it's online or in person or to some other church event. Often it's just a matter of saying, come and see. Faith is often better shared in the context of relationship. Two invitations, follow me, come and see. In our reading today, Jesus tells Philip to follow him. And Philip then goes and invites Nathaniel to come and see Jesus invitation. Jesus invites us to follow him, and then we get to invite others. 
Now today we're reading from John's Gospel. John's Gospel contains some really amazing things like, like the seven I am statements. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the one true vine. And of course, John contains one of the best known Bible verses, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that, that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the team that we're on, this team, Jesus. And yet this Jesus, he wasn't always who people expected him to be, and he's still not. You know, Jesus, he came as a humble king, a, a loving savior. I mean, he started in this world as a tiny, tiny baby. He was not who people expected him to be. He grew up in this little town called Nazareth, a town of about 200 to 400 people. And Nazareth was just, it was just an unremarkable little town. It depended on a city nearby for its financial support, and it didn't maybe have the best reputation in the area. And so when Philip told Nathaniel that Jesus was the one that Moses and the prophets had been writing about, Nathaniel concluded that Philip must be mistaken since Jesus was the son of Joseph of Nazareth. Now we see Jesus differently because we are Easter people. We know more of the story. We know that Jesus is the light of the world. We know that Jesus came to offer grace, and salvation. So let's read our text this morning. I'm reading John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. I invite you now to hear God's word. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This concludes our gospel reading for this morning. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Follow me, Jesus said. And so we do. We do our best to follow Jesus, but we may find ourselves wondering, are, are we doing it right? Does following Jesus mean that we change who we are? Does it mean being exactly like Jesus? Well, no, no, no it doesn't. You see, like pieces of a puzzle, we're all different in many, many ways. But just as each individual puzzle piece is important to the whole of the puzzle, each person with all of their uniqueness is important to the whole of this church, to the whole of God's kingdom. Some speak frankly. Some grow into leaders. Some offer compassion and mercy. Some help with their financial and other resources. I mean, look at these two guys that we just read about. They are different from Jesus and they're different from each other. Philip strikes me as kind of a, a missionary type guy. Jesus called him and he just went out and started telling other people. And he didn't even know all there was to know about Jesus yet. He just went and started sharing. I mean, this was, this was before the, the story about the feeding of the 5,000. And in that story, Philip is the one who's concerned there's not enough to feed all the people, but Jesus provided. Philip perhaps wasn't a leader like Peter. He may not have been a very bold missionary, 
but he was a follower of Jesus. Nathaniel, on the other hand, he appears to be a little more skeptical. It's like, like he's kind of a thinker who wants to take time to process what he's hearing and, and what he's thinking about it. So when he heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, he was like, mm, wait a minute, something isn't making sense to me. Now, Nathaniel isn't outspoken about his concerns. He's not um, a doubting Thomas verbally, for example. But when Jesus but Jesus knows Nathanael. He knows him. And when Jesus says something to Nathanael about himself that just a regular average person couldn't possibly have known, Nathanael starts to believe. It can take a while to start following Jesus, but Nathanael did start following Jesus. Neither man was just like Jesus, but that's okay because Jesus didn't say, be exactly like me. Jesus said, follow me. And they did. They became faithful disciples. They became followers of Jesus. They opened their personalities to be directed by God. I mean, I'm sure that Philip was still Philip and Nathaniel was still Nathaniel, just like I was Carrie when I was 26 and didn't know Jesus and I'm still caring now after having known him for several decades. He's guided me and my relationship with Jesus has changed many, many things about me, but I'm still me. So when disciples are asked to be Christ-like, it doesn't mean that they become little Jesus mini-me's. It means they're willing to be part of God's kingdom, to be used by God and the Holy Spirit in, in the kingdom's work. It means they acknowledge that they can't save themselves, that only Jesus can do that. Jesus didn't say, be like me. He said, follow me, follow me. And today, as then, a wide variety of people make up Jesus' followers. The church is made up of so many different people. I mean, as we sit together in the pews or as we watch online from our homes, we all have our own unique talents, our own unique strengths, right? Some of us are good at, at speaking in front of people. Some of us would rather spend our time washing the dishes. Some of us are good with numbers. Some of us are good at calling other people and having them volunteer. Some of us are worker bees. We're just willing to show up and do whatever needs to be done. Others of us are party planners. There's all kinds of people, and I can promise you, I can promise you in worship here and in worship anywhere, you're going to meet people who are being very friendly or are being very cranky, who are having great joy or are having great sorrow, people that are very quiet, people that are very welcoming, people that are running around doing things, people that are sitting quietly, maybe praying or just thinking about the word for the day. Name a personality type and you're gonna find it in God's church. So when Jesus calls us to follow him, he isn't asking us to stop being who we are. He's calling us to open ourselves up to God and to be like Jesus in loving God and in loving other people, but in a way that honors who we are with all of our strengths and all of our weaknesses and all of our gifts and all of our talents and all of the things that make us who we are, who God created us. We are to be disciples, not clones. Maybe some of you remember back in, I think, um, the late 80s and early 90s, the WWJD bracelets were really popular. WWJD stood for What Would Jesus Do? I'm going to suggest a different bracelet. I am going to suggest a W-S-I-D-A-A-F-O-J bracelet. Now that's a lot of letters, and you may be wondering what that stands for. I'm going to tell you. It stands for, what should I do as a follower of Jesus? What should I do as a follower of Jesus? It's a question worth asking. And to answer it, we need to know about Jesus. We need to know what it means to follow him. And, and we learn that by reading about him, by learning about him from the gospels and by learning about him from the people who are saying, come and see and are inviting us to follow Jesus. 
And then we can open ourselves up to God's word, to God's, to the Holy Spirit, so we can know who God calls us to be. Not so we can be just like Jesus, because we can't, but so that we can live lives that allow other people to catch a glimpse of who Jesus is, who catch a glimpse of, of his invitation to follow him. People can see Jesus through us. And that then leads to the second invitation. The second invitation is come and see. Jesus says, follow me. And then there's come and see. Philip can't prove to Nathaniel that Jesus is who Philip believes him to be, but he can say, come and see. You see, Philip had seen Jesus. He had met Jesus. And he wanted to share this with other people. People. Now, a churchy phrase for this is to witness, to witness to our faith. It just means to testify, to tell the truth, um, to afford evidence of something. And that sounds really complicated, and that sounds a little bit scary. But really, it's just sharing Jesus with other people. And for some people, this flows effortlessly. I have a couple of friends who can just, just tell people, about Jesus and they're comfortable doing it. And somehow or another, they make the people they're telling comfortable about sitting and talking with them. It is a sight to behold and I admire that gift. I don't have that gift. I, I just, I, I'm not made that way. It's not always so easy for me, but I want everybody to know Jesus because I've experienced the life change that knowing Jesus causes. I know the grace and mercy of Christ, and I can't think of anything, anything better than that. We want people to know Jesus. We want them to meet him. And when people meet Jesus, more and more people start to follow him, and that means that the church grows. And that's wonderful. Church growth is a good, good thing. Remember, this team, it's limitless. It's, it can be as big. It can be as big as big can be. That's what Jesus wants, but sometimes we get so excited over the growth that we start focusing on the, the technique kind of things. We start focusing on, um, I, I don't know, like, like what we put on the video screens or what we post on Facebook or, or um, the music or who sits where, whatever. And those things are important because they make up the worship of Jesus, but we lose sight sometimes of the relational aspect of following Jesus. And so many times, the best way to share Jesus with someone is through invitation and relationship, to just invite them to come and see. Come and see. I wanna be clear, this isn't just a pastor's job or an elder's job or a deacon's job. This task doesn't belong just to the people that it seems to come effortlessly to. This is a task for all of us. Remember, Jesus' invitation to follow him doesn't exclude anybody. And so our invitation to come and see needs to include everybody. So just invite someone. Invite someone to worship or a book study or a Bible study or a movie night or some other fellowship activity or, or a mission event. As you get to know someone better, invite them deeper into your life if they're a safe person. Share more with them. Share maybe what Jesus has done for you in your life, what it means to you to know Jesus. Just say, come and see. Come and see what Jesus has done for me. Come and see who Jesus is. We never know when something we say or something that we do might be the moment that someone decides to check it out or maybe even decides that they're going to accept Jesus' invitation to follow him. You're thinking about what we read this morning. You might wonder, well, who is Nathaniel anyway? He didn't seem too interested in Jesus. He's hardly mentioned in scripture at all. But remember, the invitation to follow Jesus is for everyone, everyone. Philip meets Jesus and he starts telling people, inviting people. The text reminds us, it invites us to speak the truth of our faith experience, even to those people that we think maybe don't wanna hear it. 
even to those people who might decide that we're just a little unusual because of our faith. If we are faithful, God can use the things we say and the things we do to claim even people who find the story of Jesus to be absolutely incredulous. And it's also a reminder for some of us that there maybe was a point in our lives when we didn't know Jesus, when we weren't following Jesus, and someone said to us, come and see, come and see. Now I know that in many ways, it's harder to do that now, and it seems likely that it's probably going to get even harder. But friends, we know Jesus. We know Jesus. How, how can we do anything but invite others to come and see, especially as our faith continues to grow and mature, and we see how Jesus continues to work in our lives and the lives of others. The world is not a soft place, but faith in Jesus can bring us so much peace and so much comfort and so much assurance. Jesus called Philip, and Philip responded by inviting Nathaniel. Jesus said, follow me. Philip said, come and see. It can be hard, but it's not nearly as hard as we sometimes make it. It's just a one step at a time kind of process, kind of like putting together a puzzle. And we're together today in various ways, worshiping Jesus. Follow me, Jesus said, invitation one. The second one, come and see. The second one is for us to issue to others. When people ask us, what do y'all do at that church anyway? All we have to do is say, come and see. And if you're hearing this sermon today, and if you've heard the call to follow Jesus, but you're still unsure, you're still curious, you just don't know quite what it means, I'm inviting you to come and see. Spend some more, t more time in worship with us. Give one of the pastors a call. Talk to somebody that you know that, that comes regularly to church. Come and see. The invitation is always there. I'm gonna conclude as I began with some words written by Bob Goff from his book, Love Does, because real talk, Bob Goff says it way better than I ever, ever could. He said, there are things in life you and I don't get invited to. I've never been invited to the Oscars or to, the Paul, or to Paul McCartney's birthday party or to a space shuttle launch. I'm waiting for my invitation to National Treasure 3. If I got an invitation to any of those things or for that matter to the real White House Easter egg hunt, I'd definitely go. There's nothing like feeling included. There is only one invitation it would kill me to refuse, yet I'm tempted to turn it down all the time. I get the invitation every morning when I wake up to actually live a life of complete engagement, a life of whimsy, a life where love does. It doesn't come in an envelope. It's ushered in by a sunrise, the sound of a bird, or the smell of coffee drifting lazily from the kitchen. It's the invitation to actually live to fully participate in this amazing life for one more day. Jesus says, follow me. We say, come and see. My friends, may God bless you. Amen. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come now and follow me. Lay down your earthly care, he said, And I will set you free. I came to Jesus as I was, I had no gift to bring. He took my stubborn will, my pride, And taught my heart to sing.
I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, come now and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live for him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am the dark world's light. Look not upon me, your morn shall rise, and all the days be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in the light of life I'll walk till trance.